Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sad. I'm sad because I finally found the perfect anime, something so obscene and offensive to literally everyone in the world that I no longer know what to do with myself. The search, it may finally be over, which is why as I present this masterpiece, I ask you to rack your brains and help a brother out, cause there has to be something that is at least equivalent to Orotsuko Doji, Legend of the Overfiend. Legend of the Overfiend was originally a manga, uh, excuse me, an arrow manga written by the legendary Toshio Maeda, whose other credits include La Blue Girl, a series I fondly remember not pirating off of LimeWire. Ratsuko Doji stands out as one of the few titles that is far more graphic in its animated form than its original manga, which should say a lot about what we're about to get into. Balls. Originally an OVA series released direct to video from 1987 to 89, Legend of the Overfiend made its way to the West in the early 90s as a full length movie and brought with it a legacy of shock and awe that remains in a small pocket of the internet today. A film so offensive, so graphic, so up my alley that it shook the world of animation and that was after it got cut and censored. It was literally too hardcore for the West at the time, and some will argue that this is just Gentai, and many websites post it as such, but I'm here to tell you that no, this is anime. This is everything that I love about anime. And you thought Wicked City was bad. Wicked City is for babies, little crying babies who need a pacifier, over fiend. This is the real stuff, a cult classic. And Bonsai Pop is nothing if not a cult. So join us and let's get into it. Quick note before we get rolling, due to the excellent nature of this film, I'm about to stretch my limits of innuendo in hopes the YouTube gods pass gracious and lenient judgment through ignorance of this topic. Also, if you are easily offended or mentally affected by not 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 non-violence of a not 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 non-aero nature, then no judgment, but you should probably back out now. For the record, I do not condone the flavor grape. In any way, uh, not grape in the mouth or any other crevice, this film is obviously obscene for obscenity's sake and should be viewed that way only. Moving on. Look, even in 2020, I think we can all agree that Japan is weird. In the best of ways, obviously. Okay, well, sometimes not. But anyway, the point is, for a culture that puts on a suit and tie for the world, it has a wild side that puts most others to shame, and I think that's why it's so shocking. It's like finding out your lifelong white bread Christian neighbors are actually Shiza Kinkos who swing on Fridays. The greatest thing about Overfiend is that it actually has the balls to have a story and a message. Which kind of puts out there right away with exposition, explaining that there are three worlds, one of the demons, one of the man-beasts, and one of the humans, and that every 3,000 years, these worlds are united by the Shoujin, or super god, in English, the Overfiend. Then we immediately forget about that as we're assaulted by demon diddles and some lady with four sweater pups. It's been less than two minutes. That's how you know. This is gonna be good. Suddenly, it's 80s Japan, and we're in high school, and there's some jam and chiptune music, and all is seemingly fine, until it's not. Meet our main character, I, th I think. Tatsuo Nagamo, who is petting Sally in the girls' locker room closet while bedroom mugging some unexpecting co-eds. Now, demon dogging was one thing, but this is when we all went, Whoa. And by we, I mean me, Ty, and our awesome over 18 patrons who watched this film with us and allowed this video to be possible with their support. Join us. Be one of us. From here on out, things just get crazier and crazier. This girl that Nagumo is specifically fixated on is Akemi Ito, a gymnast. And let's be real, Nagumo is clearly confused. It's all about the volleyball and the soccer teams, but whatever, this is a judgment free zone. Nagumo has it bad for Akemi, so bad he American pies right in the middle of the gym. Jim? Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Oh! oh. And that was round two, post locker room. Apparently refractory periods don't exist in the Eastern Hemisphere. Again? Not again. Not again, man. And then this jock somehow notices the pants sneeze and chucks a basketball at Nagumo's face, makes fun of his pop tent, and then licks some blood off of his face which, you know, is normal kid stuff. And then the movie begins to power up. Akami is taken into a female teacher's office for a talk and proceeds to get icky tosined, and her nice high school flavor turns grape. Also, Nagamo is watching again because he likes to exhibit early warning signs of a personality disorder, but it goes too far even for him, and just as he's about to save the day, we meet our other main lead, Amano Jaku, 
a beast man from beast man land and he's all like nah man let's wait and see what happens and then this happens <laughs> Guess where that thing goes? Let's take a quick break to talk about Maeda-san, the mangaka. Sorry, Arrow Mangaka. So this guy is from Osaka, a hugely important city in the Kansai region of Japan. It's an old city with hundreds of years of history, amazing food, culture, and a thriving scene for the abbreviation of Barney, Dora, Snoopy, and Mickey. It sounds like Budsum. A scene we here at Bonsai Pop are highly interested in experiencing, and by that I mean I'm highly interested in dragging Tyler into Osaka jail and watching him get burned by women he doesn't understand. It's literally a Patreon goal, so please help us achieve our dreams. Anyway, Maeda wanted to get into entertainment for adults so he could bypass all commercial restraints of mainstream media. And honestly, that philosophy is not only badass, but his execution of it shows exactly what art can be like without much policing. He was also clearly influenced by not only Osaka itself, that being the setting of the film, but its underground being a common theme of uh, character interaction, let's say. Honestly, the majority of Uratsuka Doji feels like it was written by a 10 year old who spends too much time under their dad's bed and has major mommy issues. But there's something to the ridiculousness that is raw and palpable, something that's extremely hard to find nowadays. Also, Uratsuka Doji came out at the exact right time and place in animation history to even be allowed, a time when Japan was testing its limits with storytelling and darkness. And Legend of the Overfiend certainly takes that uh, to the extreme. So, Akemi gets her kidneys examined by a demonic endoscopy while Nagumo and Amano argue over whether or not it's the best time to interrupt yet. However, the demon notices our voyeurs and blows the door off, knocking Nagumo out. Amano, however, enters the room and goes Super Saiyan God, dispatching the evil Gaino and revealing that he thinks he's found the Shoshi. Don't remember what that is? That's fine, I didn't either. Basically, long story short, Amano, a beast man, has been looking for the Shojin for 300 years because he thinks the Shojin comes with a promise of a better world. Not that Amano doesn't like his world, in fact, he loves it. It's just that if it could be better, he would like to see that. And apparently the Shojin or super god or overfiend is hiding in the body of a human, so he's been out scouting for like 300 years with his little gremlin friend who's always got wood and his sister Megumi, a blue haired beast man girl who is also an nymphomaniac, that's that's canon. Now naturally, Akami wakes up from her traumatic exam and sees Nagumo, decides he saved her, and instantly falls in love with him because anime. Still on the hunt, Amano thinks that the blood licking jock is the Shojin, and Megumi thinks that Nagumo is the Shojin. The two of them stalk their respective candidates. Now that night, the jock is drinking whiskey with a harem, as all jocks in high school obviously did, and Nagumo is making out in a bush with Akami. All of a sudden, the jock gets a pants touchdown, and its release is so powerful he blows all the ladies out of the room and into the hall where they're massacred by some demons. And when he's attacked by said demons, he turns into wicked post-midnight snack and an epic fight ensues. And to prove that the jock boy is the overfiend, Amino hits him with some key blasts, but he hilariously just dies. Meanwhile, Megami interrupts Nagumo and Akemi's little, little festy thing that they're doing, and Akami runs away, and while following her, Nagumo gets plastered by the return of Truck-kun. It's hilarious, but instead of being isekai Nagumo is actually pronounced dead, but his death awakens the Shojin inside, who remember, hasn't gotten off in 3,000 years. This super demon god thing then proceeds to get up and, uh, and, and grape a nurse in the mouth. And, uh, and, then, and then he goes eastbound and down. But at the moment of his release, he supermans his lowest lane, totally blowing her up, like actually exploding her. And then he loses all his marbles. But, uh, but in all seriousness, all of a sudden he sprouts like 50 uber powerful pork swords, which tear apart the hospital as he grows to a tremendous size. And these danger dongs suck up all the helpless people, fueling the over fiend's power and obviously it's all swept under the rug the next day and uh you know blamed on a gas explosion now what i love about this so far is that unlike wicked city which has very clear messages and thematic characters things to dive into overfiend really has nothing it's just raw kinetic energy and ridiculousness and uh, it's very very offensive instead of saying something new it serves to highlight in graphic detail what we already know basically that men are pigs and evil is everywhere and yeah things can get this bad i don't know about a giant demon with 
you know, 20 wanks. But it's important to remember that not all stories are told in the same way, and not all writers reveal their hands slowly and methodically, and considering how many loads are dumped in this film, I think it would be presumptuous of us to judge Overfiend before it busts. Just saying. Anyway, moving on. Enter Japan's version of a red-headed stepchild, Nikki. This guy is also all about Akame, who is all about Nagumo, so obvious tension exists. While the latter two are off in Beastman world getting exposition I already gave you, this guy is getting a foot in his mouth from some ladies who noticed he was feeling bad. And like, we did not appreciate what you got, man. <sighs> One man's trash. In fact, Nikki's masculinity is so fragile, he summons a duster huffing demon to do away with these very kind women and give him a new Garrett Wang, something he apparently has to attach himself. And once the deed is done, he turns into a Yu Yu Hakusho extra and proceeds to stalk Nagumo, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Which happens to be just as Nagumo once again pulls an American pie all over poor, unsatisfied Akami's bread and butter. Nikki just busts in and goes all dicing on her face. Apparently vitamin B12 is extremely powerful in this timeline. This all turns into a hostage situation I can't find a way to appropriately describe, but it results in Nagumo being crushed by a bunch of steel beams and then Nikki eats his blood too. I don't know, I guess blood and nut soup is a secret to great abs, but because this is over fiend, obviously the scene's flavor gets a little bit too grapey again, and then Nagumo resurrects as a shojin, and despite going full demon powered by shojin blood and protein, Nikki is seemingly dispatched quickly and Nagumo runs off to hide becoming a human again. Afterwards, Amino gets a vision of the future where the Shoujin is turned into a kaiju, sporting an entire family of Johnsons which are shooting baby gravy lasers causing a huge disaster in Osaka. Akami finds Nagumo hiding in a locker uh, again while Nikki's body is being put back together by whatever these ladies are. The two lovebirds proceed to finally become the beasts with two backs. That is until Nagumo actually becomes a beast, but Akami's kind of into it. I don't know. I almost had to close my eyes because of what happened the last time Nagumo entered the meat locker, but that doesn't happen this time. And honestly, I'm gonna have to mark spoiler territory here. And believe me, I have only glanced over this film so far. It's an hour and 45 minutes long and definitely not for kids. So if you go looking for it, you've been warned. Now, Let's get into the really good stuff. So instead of Akami blowing up from a godlike shot of fertilizer, we're given Maeda's idea of an educational health film as Nagamo's little soldiers find their hill on which to die, and then all hell breaks loose. Energy erupts from everywhere as the three worlds start breaking down. Nagumo begins to achieve his final kaiju form equipped with a thousand beaver bashers which shoot hyper powerful Mona capable of destroying entire towns. Meanwhile Nikki, who is possessed by something I don't know, in turn possesses the demon god of the sea to fight the Chojin in an epic kaiju battle. And then, then, this movie. This movie of all movies has the balls to get philosophical with us. After an hour and 20 minutes plus of absolutely inane debauchery, the plot just comes back and we're expected to think. See, all of these horrible things are happening because of one person's selfish desires. And that is Amino. The guy that wasn't even upset with his life, he thought it would just be kind of cool if it could get better. Why not try to find the Shoujin? Well, Amano, it's because the Shoujin is kind of a dick, and instead of making life better, he just pulls an Anakin and messes everything up. But guess what? Nagumo isn't even the Shoujin. It's the baby. What baby? The baby that didn't exist until five seconds ago, formed between Nagumo and Akemi. This baby is the true Shoujin, the harbinger of the apocalypse, who now possesses the body of Akemi, who is buried within the body of Nagumo. It's basically insection. This cluster of cells is basically the goddess Shiva, and goes on a monologue explaining that in order to bring about something new, old things have to be destroyed. It's the way things work in the living world. The true overfiend explains that pain is part of evolution. And basically it turns out that the Shoujin created the three worlds for the demons, beastmen, and the humans, and then took a 3,000 year nap to see how it all worked out when he woke up. And after waking up, he was very disappointed by the greed and violence he's bred and feels that he needs to try again. So he's just gonna gestate for a hundred years inside of Osaka Castle and then resurrect everyone's souls and evolve them into beings who wish to love each other. Then he proceeds with that plan, destroys the world, the end. Now I know what you're thinking. Amazing. 
and yes it is. But what's weird is while The Legend of the Overfiend, or Orotsuki Doji, whatever you want to call it, is incredibly over the top and extremely offensive in almost every way possible, it kind of justifies its own existence in the end. Like the entire film is at the precipice of an apocalypse meant to bring order back to a world of corruption. It kind of makes sense that all of these terrible things are happening and the overt, arrow nature of it is actually on script. A creature of change and immense power is trying to birth itself into the universe by any means possible, and by its own words, evolution is painful. And let's remember cult classics are classics for a reason, and sometimes better than traditional classics like The Godfather, for example. Because cult classics speak a truth in a way that not everyone likes to see. And I can't believe I'm actually saying this, but not only does this film make sense, but it's kind of sound. So why am I really making this video? Well, because Legend of the Overfiend is awesome, and I can, and I like to push limits. However, I'm also extremely into entertainment with little restraint. And while I really, really don't like things with as much grapey overtones as this movie has, underneath it is a radical exposition on the depravity of civilization and almost a disdain for how disgusting human beings can be when our hearts are filled with hatred or greed or lust. Which is ironic because this film is kind of brushed under the rug as just being fetishistic. But one thing is for sure, it is fascinating to watch someone really just run wild and pull it off. And I've only been talking about the story. The animation is perfect, as you can see, for what it is. The music was S tier. We were talking about it the entire time. And I mean, all jokes aside, as a piece of cinema, Ratsuki Doji is not only competent, but I think it achieves its goals perfectly. Highly popularizing tentacle prawn, but also subverting perversion with a hidden message left in plain sight. We typically consider the classics Cowboy Bebop, Evangelion, Full Metal, etc., to be something completely new and genre defining for their time while still remaining relevant today. And I think Overfiend totally fits that category. So while you might need to scald off your skin in the shower after watching it, that doesn't take away the continued impact it has as a classic. And just because your impact can be fetishized doesn't take away from the impact itself. I mean, just look at me. I'm a twink ass alt guy. You'll love it. Seriously, it's getting to the point where I need like a hairpin for this shit. So that was Legend of the Overfiend, my brand new favorite anime movie of all time. Anyway, I'm not going to drag this out. I would like to thank our very special patron of the week. Blur, thank you so much for being our patron. We very much appreciate your support. And of course, our Super Saiyan God of the Week, Kits Bash J, who is a brand new Super Saiyan God. We have so many of you to get to. We are going to be picking one per week. I can't tell you how awesome it is to have so many God tier patrons. It's freaking crazy. And definitely make sure to check out our Patreon. Me and Tyler just started a podcast specifically for the Patreon where we look at the previous videos week. So obviously this week we're going to be looking back at Overfiend and we, you know, we shoot the shit, we talk about stuff. It's, it's a good time. You're definitely gonna wanna get that. With all that said, my name is Mike. Thank you so much for watching. This is Bonsai Pop, and I will see you next week. Bye.